Today I've got a really nice problem that I found on the Stack Exchange, on the Math.Stack Exchange, and it's uh, number 413624 if you want to look it up. And what I like about this is it looks to be not very difficult just by the statement, find the maximum of a certain function. But when you notice how this function is defined, you'll see that this is a bit tricky. So notice we have f of x equals sine of x plus the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of sine of x plus t cosine of x times f of t dt. So there's some sort of like recursive type definition of this function in that it's defined in terms of itself or the integral of itself. So I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so let's see how we might do this. So since this integral is with respect to t, and we have sine of x and cosine of x in here, those are constant with respect to the integral, and thus we can factor them out. So let's do that. So that'll leave me with this sine x, which is this first one, and then we'll have plus sine of x times the integral from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 of f of t dt. So that comes from this sine of x times f of t. And then next we'll have plus the cosine of x times the integral from minus pi over 2 up to pi over 2 of t times f of t dt. So there, that's a real nice way of writing this expression so that we can see exactly how this function f depends on the integral of itself and obviously this integral of t times itself. So where are we going to go from here? Well, I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation first and then we're going to use this really nice trick which, like I said before, is described in this post. So the notation that I will introduce is labeling this integral as a and labeling this second integral as b. And we could just leave these integrals around throughout our whole calculation, but this will just make it look a little simpler or seem a little simpler. Okay, so that leaves us with the following definition of f of x. We have f of x is equal to 1 plus capital A times sine of x and then plus capital B times the cosine of x. That's just from like doing a little bit of factoring of sine of x out of these first two terms. But now let's notice that f depends on the integral of itself. In other words, it depends on a. So that motivates us to integrate both sides of this equation with respect to x from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So let's do that. So we'll have the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of f of x dx equals 1 plus a times the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of sine of x dx and then plus b times the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of cosine of x dx. So what I'd like to point out here is that a is a constant and b is also a constant because they're these integrals of f. Um, so that's why we can take them out of the x integrals down here. Another thing that I'd like to notice is that this integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of f of x is exactly a. So we can write that in here like that. Okay, nice. And now let's quickly notice that if we take the antiderivative of sine, we get negative cosine. Evaluating negative cosine at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 will give us 0. So this integral is in fact just equal to zero. But then we can use the fact that cosine is even or just directly integrate this to sine, evaluate at pi over two and minus pi over two, and you'll see that this integral right here is equal to two. So that gives us this nice equation starting over here at the left, a equals two times b. So let's write that down. So we have a equals two times b. Okay, nice. Now we're going to do essentially the same thing, but instead of just integrating this directly, we'll multiply by x and integrate it. Okay, so let's do that. 
that'll leave us with the integral from minus pi over two to pi over two of x times f of x dx is equal to one plus a times the integral from minus pi over two up to pi over two of x times the sine of x. And then plus b, we've got our integral from minus pi halves up to pi halves of x times cosine of x. Okay, so that's good. But then let's next notice that this integral of x f of x is exactly equal to our number b over here. So we can extend this over and say, oh, well really what I have is just our number b right there. Okay, and now we have two integrals to calculate and they both are easily calculated with integration by parts. We can use the tabular or the DI method for integration by parts for each of them, given that they're a fairly simple polynomial times a trigonometric function. So let's look at this first one first. We have the integral of x times sine of x. So we'll take the derivative down this column, one, zero, antiderivative down this column, that'll be minus cosine of x minus sine of x. And then we'll match on the diagonal, like so, and then we'll alternate the sine. So that'll leave us with something like this. So that means we have one plus a, and then this will be minus x times cosine of x, from this first term and then plus sine of x. So plus sine of x. And then we have to evaluate this from minus pi halves up to pi halves. Okay, good. Now let's do the same thing for x cosine x. We can fit that in right here. So x cos x. Derivative is one and then zero. Antiderivative is sine of x and then negative cosine of x. Okay, then we can match, so match, match, plus, minus. So that'll leave us with something of this form. We'll have b, then we'll have x times sine x. So let's write that, x times sine x, and then minus negative cosine x. So that'll be plus cosine of x. And then we need to evaluate that from minus pi halves up to pi halves. Okay, so let's see what each of these evaluations will give us. So let's see, cosine of pi over two and cosine of negative pi over two are both zero. So this will just be zero. Likewise, this down here will also be zero. Sine of pi over two is one and sine of negative pi over two is negative one. Subtracting those, we get two. So that means this term right here, all when said and done, will give us the number two. So at the moment, we have this is the same thing as two times one plus a. But now let's notice that doing the same thing here will pick up uh, two minus signs because of this x right here. But then the minus sign built into the subtraction means that this will also zero out. Now I'd like to point out that we could have known this earlier given the fact that x times cosine of x is an odd function. And we're integrating an odd function over this domain from minus pi over two to pi over two, which is always gonna give us something that is zero. Okay, so let's see, we've got b is equal to two times one plus a. In other words, it's equal to two a plus two. Okay, so that combined with this a equals 2b should allow us to solve for each of these. So let's plug in a equals 2b to this, and we'll see that we have 4b plus two is equal to our original b, just extending that down. But then very, very quickly, what we'll see is that b is equal to negative two over three. So that's just from moving some things around and then solving pretty easily. But if b is negative two-thirds, then that tells us that a is equal to negative four over three. Great. So that'll allow us to write down a nice formula here for our function f of x. So if a is negative four over three, that makes one plus a negative one-third, and then b is negative two-thirds, so negative two over three. Okay, so let's start the next board with that new cleaned up version of f 
and we can finally find its maximum. So we just determined that this crazy recursive definition of f involving its own integral boils down to f of x equals negative one-third sine of x minus two-thirds cosine of x. And from here, our goal is to find the maximum of this function. So the maximum will occur when the derivative is zero. So let's calculate the derivative. And we can easily calculate the derivative now that we have this simple version here. So that'll give us minus one third times cosine of x, and then plus two thirds times sine of x. So we need to know when that is equal to zero. So we can move some things around and we'll see that two thirds sine of x equals one third cosine of x. We can divide by cosine and then divide by three halves and that will leave us with something like, this means that the tangent of x is equal to one half, I believe. Yeah, that's what you get. Okay, so we see that a maximum will occur, or a maximum or a minimum will occur when the tangent is equal to half. And now let's notice with the structure with these minus signs over here, we'll have a maximum for this function when sine of x and cosine of x are both positive or both negative, I should say. So they both have to be negative in order to make the tangent positive. Furthermore, we'll see that we get a minimum in the dual version where sine of x and cosine of x are both positive. Okay, good. So now let's introduce a little bit of notation. So let's let alpha um, be such that we know that the tangent of alpha is equal to half. And we also know that sine of alpha and cosine of alpha are both less than zero. So they're both negative. And now we'd like to calculate sine and cosine of alpha so that we can get this maximum value. And we can do this calculation using a right triangle built out of this tangent. It'll seem like we're doing something sketchy because it'll look like we have negative side lengths, but it all works out in the end. Okay, so let's draw our triangle. So let's say this is angle alpha. So if you wanna be really careful about this being in the unit circle, then you'd wanna put the angle alpha going down that way, but I'm just using this as a placeholder. And then since we have the tangent of alpha is one half, that means we can label this length one and this length two, given that the tangent is opposite over adjacent. And now using the Pythagorean theorem, we can see that this is the square root of five. And so that's just a mock-up for the completion of the triangle. What we really have is the sine of alpha is equal to not one over the square root of five, but negative one over the square root of five. And then the cosine of alpha is not two over the square root of five, but negative two over the square root of five. Again, again given that we need those signs here. But since we know this value of alpha will give us a maximum for our function, we know that f of alpha will be our maximum, which in the end will be something like, let's see, one over three times the square root of five, and then plus four over three times the square root of five. That's what we get for putting these two things together. So I guess you could add all of that up to five over three times root five. And that would be our maximum value. And that's a good place to stop.